Hello. All right, here we go. We are going to talk about conflict in Ohio. And this is a portion of our history that is specific to us, Ohio. And we're going to be talking about, and you're going to be learning about how Ohio becomes the center of conflict again. Um, very similar in the way that we were talking about it during the French and Indian War with England and France fighting for the Ohio Territory. So here again, Ohio is in the middle of conflict because it is desired by two different groups of people. And uh, unfortunately, compromise and sharing was not an option for either one of these groups. So conflict in Ohio, and I wanna show you this. So this is a map I showed you a few lessons ago um, showing that proclamation line that was set out by King George III. So this was one of the leading causes of the, set, um, the colonists being upset with the king because during the French and Indian War, he had promised them land as payment for helping him win, right? Um, and at the same time, he promises the Native Americans living in that area that he would let them keep that land, which is kind of a strange promise to, to make uh, because that was their land to begin with. But he promised them that his colonists would not go past that line. You can see that line they're running north to south, and then across the map it says lands reserved for the Indians. So if you remember, King George basically promises the same portion of land to two different groups of people, um, which angered the colonists. And um, you know, and they, they, you know, some of them went across that line anyways, and there's fighting back and forth, and that just caused more, more tension leading up to the Revolutionary War. Revolutionary War happens. King George is no longer our king. We now have a president, George Washington. I'll talk about him later. And right now, this is um, what the United States looked like in 1790. That gray area is land that either belongs to Spain at this point, which is, you can see it down south in Florida, or uh, everything west of the Mississippi River, that is territory that belongs to France at this point um, that we then buy during the Louisiana Purchase, but that's, that's later on. Uh, the pink are the states. You can see Virginia and Georgia look very different now uh, compared to back then. Tennessee is unorganized territory at that point. And you can see that uh, other area, that orangey tan color, the Northwest Territory that includes Michigan right here, Ohio territory, what would be Indiana, Illinois. Um, that is somewhat organized to a point with um, leadership and who's gonna oversee that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but yeah, this is what it looks like. And right uh, here, this map is showing population density. This is an older map from that time period. And what that means is that darker colored orange those are the, the, that's where most people live, right? So think about crowded cities, large towns. And as it goes out into more and more less dark orange and tan colors, that's fewer people. So those are settlements, right? Look how they kind of follow the rivers right here. There's a settlement area of frontiersmen and villages and pioneers and settlers living out in what's Northern Kentucky. Um, and then right there where that blue arrow is pointing, that is Ohio. So what is going to happen now that we are the United States and not British colonies, people living on the East Coast, they want to move West for a couple different reasons. For one, the cities and towns were crowded. Another reason was uh, people who fought in the revolution, they were promised land as payment, just like people in the colonies were promised land for payment when they fought against the French. So the same thing happens again. At one point, we don't have any money to pay our soldiers during the revolution. So land is promised to them as payment. And back then, if you owned land, you could control your destiny. So if you were an average everyday person and you were able to get land enough to start your own farm, you could change the course of your family's life from then on. Other than that, you were working on someone else's land and they were getting rich off of your labor. In this case, you can control your own destiny. So land was a good thing, they wanted it. So people are going to start moving out there in droves, which means many, many people, 
thousands of families are going to start moving west. Okay, so while that's happening, here's a map of Ohio. Again, we're just going to keep that in mind. This is an older map of the rivers traced out there. The Ohio River is really important because if you remember, we talked about traveling on the river, that's like traveling on the highways. Okay, that was the main mode of transportation. It was much easier to travel by river than it would be across land. Okay. I had you take a look at this picture here as an I see, I think, I wonder with our lesson. So this is a picture of a flatboat. So flatboats were um, very popular during this time period. You watched some of the videos where they're talking about how those worked. And if your family had money enough to either build your own flatboat or maybe even borrow or hitch a ride with somebody else's flatboat, this is how you would have moved into this new territory. Literally packing everything that belonged to you in this boat going downriver, even down to the animals, right? Because if you're going to have your own land, run your own farm, you're going to need animals with you. And there's, um, you know, there, there's nothing in this territory that you're going to go buy more of these animals. You needed to take everything with you that you needed to live in this new territory. Um, once they reached their destination, these boats would have been taken apart and reassembled as their cabin. Because during this time period, there were no Home Depots or Lowe's that you could go out and buy lumber if you needed it. If you needed lumber, you had to go cut down a massive size tree and cut it down into lumber, which took a lot of work. So this was a multi-purpose thing that they had. Um, if you didn't have money for a flat boat, you had to find other ways of traveling. Many people walked, um, but also many people took the rivers. I wonder if any of you noticed yesterday, I really like how this artist included the canoe, possibly with Native Americans or European settlers or American settlers, I should say now. Um, but a lot of interactions, both good and bad, took place on the river. While that's happening, we need to remember that this Ohio territory was not just empty land that nobody was living in. Um, we have these native tribes that had been living in this territory for many, many generations now, um, and this was their home. That dark line running along the southern border here of Ohio, that's the Ohio River. So think about if you study this map, and I show you this line right here. This is the Ohio River. Those that's would have been the main artery or the main um, path that these flatboats would have been traveling down. If you take a look at this map, I'm going to pause here, and during this presentation, I'm going to pause every once in a while. I want you to answer these questions, uh, and then you'll send them in to me on a Google Doc. Which tribes do you think would have been? the tribes that would have interacted with the flatboats more than any others. So which tribes do you think would have been coming across these pioneers, these settlers on their flatboats before any of the other ones? Okay. So we're taking a look at it and it would have been the Mingo, right? The Shawnee, right? They're coming right around this area. Amelia, where you guys are, right around here, right about where I'm at, Hamilton County, Cincinnati, right around here, okay, in Miami Shawnee Territory. Remember these lines. These are boundaries that would have been moving back and forth. These tribes, these nations did not always get along with each other. On the other hand, they sometimes did get along with each other. So these would have been, they would have had relationships with each other, good and bad, just like everybody has those relationships with people around them. If you remember, we talked about their, their homes and their villages that they lived in. Here's a good depiction, an older drawing of longhouses in the stockade. Um, we talked about the that's for defensive purposes. But then here's a good depiction or a good illustration of showing what these towns, these villages, the, even close to city size, would have looked like with these nations living in the Ohio Territory. So if you remember... We talked about how these people were farmers. They were hunters. Farming allowed them to stay in one area. They grew the three sisters. And here we have 
the wigwams for the individual families and the longhouses for large gatherings and meetings. So I'm gonna come back to this map real quick. Take a look at this map. I'm gonna come back here real fast right here. Um, it's going to be important because the people we're gonna be talking about right now, the tribes, the nations we're gonna be talking about are the Shawnee and the Miami, okay? So these, these guys, these nations right here, they're gonna be really important. All right, moving on, moving on, moving on. All right, so this is Little Turtle. This is um, not his native name. This is the name that's recorded in the history books. Um, but this is a rough translation, I understand it, of, a, of his native name. And he was a Miami war chief. The Miami nation were very strong warriors. Very few tribes would willingly go up against the Miami if, um, if they had a choice to, to negotiate. They would. Um, many people were not volunteering to fight against the Miami. They, they were pretty strong as a nation. So my uh, Little Turtle was one of their leaders. And he is their, one of their main war chiefs during this time period, okay? Um, he sees what's going on with the settlers coming in. The, the rising conflict between his people and the settlers has him concerned for many reasons, most of which is he does not want to see his land being lost to other people. This would be the equivalent of you having people coming into your house, into your yard, in taking it over. You would not be okay with that. At the same time, there is another war chief um, who go that is referred to in history as Blue Jacket. Now, what's interesting about these depictions of the, of the native people, um, I'm going to come back here to Little Turtle real quick. Um, these are historic drawings of him. Now, remember, no photography back then. So the best we have are drawings, sketches, or paintings. Or in some cases, we don't have those at all of those people. So Little Turtle, these are historical sketches of him. Um, so this is a good interpretation of what he looks like. Blue Jacket, on the other hand, we do not have a historical depiction of him. Okay, There is even some debate about Blue Jacket of whether or not he was even part of a Native American nation. He was, he was in the Shawnee Nation. So here we have Little Turtle belongs to the Miami Nation. Blue Jacket belongs to the Shawnee Nation. And the debate is, was he part of the Shawnee Nation where he was um, born into it? Uh, his ancestors were Shawnee. Or was he a European slash American who somehow became a part of that nation and adopted their way of life and they adopted him into that? That was not uncommon from that for that time period. So here's what's going on. He um, is a part of the Shawnee and, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Let me get back to it. So he could have possibly been a child who would have been adopted into the tribe, uh, which happened many times the, the nations or the tribes, they would um, kidnap children from, the, from settlements and adopt them into their nation as a way of like replacing people who had died in conflict. And in many cases, the kids preferred living with the tribes than living in, in, in a settlement uh, just because of how children grew up differently in those places. Or he could have been a settler that chose to join the Shawnee um, of his own will. That also happened. There is record of many people who have done that. So we're not sure if Blue Jacket was an actual Shawnee native or if he was a white American who joined the Shawnee and took up their cause and decided to live as one of them. That was not uncommon. That happened a lot. What we do know is that he is known for wearing a blue jacket. Now, you know, where did that jacket come from? We don't know, but it's interesting to consider that during the French and Indian War, the Shawnee were siding with the French who were known for wearing blue jackets. So you can see this here, this is a, uh, as an interpretation or what we think blue jacket may have looked like. And this artist decided to show his blue jacket as a French uniform. So here's what happens. That's blue jacket, right? Blue jacket and little turtle decide to 
join together. This is an idea of what these council meetings would have looked like. Here's another artist's idea of uh, the tribes coming together in one of the longhouses, for example, and negotiating joining together. Now I'm going to pause here because I want to ask you another question. Why do you think Little Turtle from the Miami and Blue Jacket from the Shawnee would have joined forces? Why do you think they would have joined forces? Because the, the nations were pretty independent, but at this point, they decide to join together for a purpose. And what do you, why do you think they would have done that? And what do you think that purpose could have been? Write down some of your ideas real fast. So after some negotiation here, Little Turtle and Blue Jacket, they join forces to fight against the people who are coming in and taking their land. They start attacking settlements. They start attacking um, families. They start attacking, they're, they're, they're pushing these people out either by force or by intimidation. Um, and this sets off a chain of, of events where it is violence and revenge back and forth um, because it would not have been uncommon for settlers to come in and attack a village of Native Americans and kill some of the members and destroy the village. And then other people, other family members find out that their extended family have been killed. So then they go seek revenge, maybe not even on the people who are a part of it. Uh, there are a lot of people who were caught in the middle of this on both sides who, who weren't even a, a part of this original fighting. They, they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Both, both sides, this was going on. So they start putting on pressure on settlers and they start, um, the violence is, is kicking in and it's becoming worse on both sides. And here comes this cartoon. So I'm going to pause here. Um, and I, I wouldn't mind for you to pause the video so you can look at this cartoon. This was a uh, cartoon drawn by Americans during this time period with what was going on. So I'm going to I want you to pause here. What do you think this cartoon is showing you right now? Okay, so maybe you've unpaused it. And I'm going to ask you another question. You may see this blue uniform and think, oh, that, that's French, but that's, that's not, a, that's an American soldier. But you see this red uniform. Do you remember anyone else that we talked about with red uniforms that, that, that may, uh, you may remember? So pause and write down, who, who do you think that red uniformed person is representing? Okay, here's what's going on in this, in this picture, this cartoon. England is still a part of this story. England has been beaten back. England's lost its colonies, but England is still around. And England is still upset that they lost their colonies. So what does England do in this case? They see what's going on where the tribes are fighting against American settlers and there is this bloody, terrible conflict back and forth in the Ohio Territory. And England tries everything they can to or do to support the Native Americans when they are fighting against the American settlers. So I'm going to ask you another question, to, and I'm going to pause, and I want you to think about this. Why do you think England would want to help people like Little Turtle and Blue Jacket fight and kill American settlers. Why do you think England would want to do that? England knows that if they attack the United States directly, they're going to start another war. Okay? They know that. England then figures out a way that they can cause problems for the United States by supporting the native tribes. 
And this picture is showing something that happened. This was this is something that was encouraged by England. England made a deal with the tribes that if they could prove that they were killing American soldiers or American settlers, that they would pay them with guns. And the way they did that was they said, look, if you bring us scalps, like what's going on right here, we will give you guns. So if you don't know what your scalp is, if you take the top of your, your, if you grab onto your hair, the top of your head and pull on it, don't pull on it too hard. And you can kind of feel that that's your scalp. So the native people scalp their, the people that they've killed, take it to the fortresses where the British are still hanging out and still have a presence. And they are rewarded with guns and weapons that they can then use to kill more Americans. This is England egging on more of the conflict without being a part of it themselves. Think about when you've been in an argument with somebody, maybe a brother or a sister or a friend, and it's between the two of you, but then maybe there's that other person who's on the outside of the fight, but they're helping that fight along. That's what England is doing. And America knows what they're doing, and they are not okay with it at all. This right here, this cartoon is showing right here, it says reward for 16 scalps. That was it. If you if you could prove that you had killed 16 Americans, England would give you a gun, right? So this cartoon is even saying, bring me the scalps and the king, our master, will reward you. That is what's going on here. So the United States is not happy that England is uh, putting their fingers into this conflict, if, you'll, if you understand that. And then that will lead into the next thing we're going to be talking about here in social studies when eventually we go back to war with England, but that is something that we will talk about later on. So here we are. This fighting is still going on in Ohio. And then this brings in George Washington. So I'm going to stop this video here because I don't want it to go on for too long. There's a lot more to talk about this. So we're going to leave this here. Uh, and we will pick up with him tomorrow, and we will talk about where this story goes next. Thank you, guys. Nice job. Send those notes in to me with the questions I was asking. Just jot down some of your ideas, and then uh, I'll take a look at those. Thank you very much.